Warning, this video and all other videos on this channel are for entertainment purposes only. The content of this video and all other videos on this channel are the opinions of the creator only and do not constitute legal, trading, investment, or financial advice of any kind. Investing carries a high level of risk and the majority of retail clients lose money. Do not invest in capital unless you understand the risk and you are prepared to lose it all. Right, hello and welcome to Camel Finance. I'm your boy Camel and I've got some pretty interesting charts to show you today. I've got a couple of questions that I wanted to spend just two minutes on to clear up since a lot of people had these same questions. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to give a little shout out to Gizmo XXL who has been responsible for producing all of the Camel Finance theme songs and AI generated tracks. As per the request of many of you guys, Gizmo is now on Spotify. So please, please, please go ahead and give him a follow on Spotify, I will leave a link in the description and the pinned comment. Just before we get into today's episode, a lot of people were asking me, how is it that we can show data that shows whales are accumulating Bitcoin in size, and yet the price keeps dumping? And first of all, I think it's important to point out, okay, price is not actually dumping. If we look at the year to date data for Bitcoin, it's up 33%. And since the macro bottom, since the bear market lows, it's up 257%. Okay, so saying that the price is dumping is just not really the case, is it? Okay, this is quite clearly a bull flag or a sideways range, whatever you want to call it, okay? And it's more than to be expected to have a 20 to 30% correction after a 250 odd percent move, okay? So if we zoom out and look at what's going on here, okay, this is a highly volatile asset. There are going to be pullbacks and shakeouts along the way. So you can term it dumping if you want. I personally don't consider this to be a dump. But the question remains, okay, how is it that whales are allegedly accumulating Bitcoin, yet the price is dumping? And so I thought I would share with you my theory for this, okay? First of all, for Bitcoin, there's just not that much supply. Over 70% of it is held by long-term holders. The free float of Bitcoin is only around two and a half million coins, right? Large players can't just walk into the market and buy at market, right? They can't just accumulate a huge position of multiple thousands of Bitcoins without forcing the price to move significantly to the upside and thus they don't get the price they want. So the way that we free up the limited supply is to have this horrible choppy range of about $20,000. So we had a high of something like 73, 74K and a low of about 49K and the price just keeps bouncing around this range. And the reason for this is because this is how we free up the supply to hand it over to the whales that want to accumulate a position, okay? If we start from here, anywhere will do, but we'll start from here, price moves down. Okay, first thing it does is it starts to stop out the longs on the way down. Remember, every one of those stops frees up Bitcoin, frees up capital to give over to the whales that want to hold down a large position and hold it for the longer term. As the price continues to move down, we also see shorts pile in, okay, and they set their stops along the way. And then we make a swing low, okay, the price forces up, and guess what? We liquidate the shorts back on the way up. At the same time, we trap a bunch of longs inside here with their stops below, and we repeat the whole process. But the whole point of this horrible choppy range is it wears everyone out. Bulls are wrong because we're not going up. Bears are wrong because we're not going down. And all that really happens in these ranges is everyone takes a position only to get stopped out a few days, weeks, hours, whatever the time frame is later. And every time we get stopped out from trying to trade a range, from trying to buy a breakout that doesn't break out or from trying to short a breakdown that doesn't actually resolve to new lows, every single one of those stops frees up Bitcoin to be handed over to these whales. And once they've got hold of it, then they lock it down and hold it for the long term. So just because whales are buying does not mean price necessarily has to skyrocket just yet. It will eventually likely move up once they have their position. But like I said, they can't just show up to market and buy a couple of billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. They can't do that, okay, because it would cause this huge price slippage. They would have to be buying little chunks the whole way up and their average would be terrible versus they can have this huge kind of range, like I said, that wears everyone out and stops everyone out a million times over. And every time somebody gets stopped out, every time somebody's leveraged account gets liquidated, where do you think that money goes? It goes to the long-term holders. It goes to the whales. But for me, I think the key point here is the whales are indeed accumulating. We can see that on the on-chain data. And if they're accumulating in this range, does that not suggest 
that we are likely going to get a range break to the upside in the not too distant future. I think it does personally. That's just my two sats. And some other people were asking me how to add to positions on the way up, how to increase exposure whilst maintaining risk management. And the idea for this is pretty simple. Okay, don't overthink it. If we buy a breakout back here, like we did live on the channel back at the time, okay, we bought this breakout, we had to stop somewhere a little bit below, and we started to ride this first trade higher, okay, then all we have to do is make sure, number one, the risk is managed on the first position. And once it becomes in profit enough, to justify having a second position on, okay? So if I zoom in here a bit, by the time we took this long one daily cycle, two daily cycles, we can say, okay, there's plenty of profit here. So now I can afford to add on the next cycle low, for example, with a stop something like this and target higher up, okay? And the important thing here is if the first position is gonna be stopped out, then we have to close the second position as well. So once you've taken this second trade, once you've added your exposure, you can move the stop up from here to at least break even. That takes the risk off the table for that first trade, it means you can't possibly lose. And thus, if this trade is also 2%, then you have kept your total exposure and risk to 2%. Or of course, the other way to do it is as you add the second position out of the cycle low, you can move the stop up from here underneath this one so that both positions are taken out if you are stopped out, which means you would pay a 2% stop here, but you would lock in the profit from here to here. So it's not that complicated. That's really all there is to it, okay? Take a position, manage the risk. If it squeezes higher and it looks like it's gonna be a winning trade and you want to add to it, you can add to it so long as you don't end up stacking multiple risk on top of each other and start with a managed 2% and end up with something like 10 or 20 or 30% risk, okay? Moving into today's episode. First of all, this is kind of a meme, but I thought I'd share it with you because it did tickle me, okay? Fidelity is predicting Bitcoin will reach $1 billion a coin by 2038. Now, I don't think anybody should be championing this, to be completely honest. If it can reach a billion by 2038, and I'm not convinced that it will, I would say the only way it does that is we see the complete death and collapse of all other financial systems, and this is all that is left. So I don't think we should be, what's the expression, sinking the ship to test the life rafts. I really don't think we should be doing that. I also don't think that a billion dollars is reasonable, but could we see maybe a hundred million, perhaps? by 2038, maybe, I don't know, okay, I don't know, but 1 billion to me seems a little bit overzealous. One thing I do know for sure is that the Bitcoin hash rate continues to print new all-time highs, okay, 777x are hashes. So generally speaking, price follows hash, hash continues to move up, and the reason for this is quite simple, okay, this represents capital expenditure and investment into the network, it also represents network growth. Under the hood, whilst everyone's getting bearish and trying to call tops and blah, 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 okay, this thing is still being adopted. Miners are still plugging into the network. The network is still growing. And more importantly, the network is becoming more and more secure by the day. That means, at least from a miner's perspective, they believe this network is something that is worth investing in. They believe they want a piece of it. They believe that this is a good business model to be plugging in here to try to secure the network and, of course, reap the reward from block rewards and fees. This is pretty bullish. Meanwhile, a whole heap of people are pointing at this data for Bitcoin, which shows September is a seasonally weak period for Bitcoin. Okay, here's September, as you can see. And most of the time we have a red September, suggesting that we may well see continuation of downside into this month. But we have got a few points in our favor to suggest that might not be the case this time around. We might have one of these blue months because number one, the month is already starting on a low note and we've got plenty of upward catalysts ahead of us, particularly macro data. I'm going to get to that in just a bit or towards the end, actually. And if everyone is expecting it, it's probably less likely to happen. Not to mention, as CryptoCon pointed out here, OK, we are just doing the exact same thing that we did back in 2023 today, albeit a month behind schedule. So you can see here, we went sort of February to March, April to June, June to July, August, September. I said June to July, didn't I? July to August, August to September. And then out of September, we rallied through October. And if we look at what's happening today, we went Jan to Jan, we went March to May, June to July, July to August, telling us to keep an open mind to seeing September not actually be seasonally weak as we're used to, but instead to seeing Bitcoin rally. When we zoom out and look at the bigger picture, okay, this is the current cycle in white. You can see that back here, we got a little bit overextended, okay? Back here, we made a significant run up above the prior two cycles in green and blue. And so since then, whilst everyone keeps saying the price is dumping, I make the case that this has been a very orderly walk down and actually a reversion to the mean. We got way, way, way extended. I mean, if you look at the gap between the white and the blue cycle, Okay, we got way, way, way ahead of schedule. I mean, we saw an all-time high before the halving as well. Okay, that was new. A lot of people thought that was impossible. So does it not make sense that what we're seeing is this orderly walk down or reversion to the mean? And now look where we are. We're right back on schedule. So any kind of upward move here, any kind of slow build and then into a parabola 
would really just be Bitcoin doing Bitcoin things. It would likely speak to the left translated idea being completely wrong. But as I've said over and over again, I'm okay with that. I actually would much rather see a bull market that runs for a long, long time versus something like this, which I don't really want, but has been the base case for some time. As always, we'll just keep taking it one day at a time. But I like what I'm seeing here. A lot of bearish sentiment is brewing. A lot of top callers are very, very sure of themselves. Meanwhile, when we compare this to other cycles, it really is, like I said, just undergoing an orderly walk down and a mean reversion. So I think the bullish setup is there, not to mention we've got the elections coming up in November, perhaps, okay, that could go either way. I, I don't really think politics plays a big part in it. I think the cycles are going to do the cycle things and we're going to append the narrative as we always do as investors and traders. Overall, hard for me to look at this and say, oh, I know what comes next, this. On top of that, we're about to experience a 100 and 200 weekly MA golden cross. We've actually never seen one of these before in the entire history of Bitcoin. We saw narrowing, okay? We saw very, very tight squeezing of the two before then the 100 rips and of course Bitcoin moves into a parabola. We also saw more narrowing here right before Bitcoin did Bitcoin things into a parabola. Notice how the death cross for Bitcoin in this one occurrence resulted in Bitcoin pumping to the upside, doing over 100% from the point of the death cross to the ultimate top of about 73, 74K. And right now we're getting ready to golden cross. Does it tell us to keep an open mind about seeing the blue move back above the red? Okay, something like this, and then Bitcoin doing Bitcoin things. I think so. Now it hasn't done it yet. So until such time as it's proven, until such time as it actually occurs, it seems a bit silly to be getting excited about it. But if this thing can indeed, over the next couple of weeks, experience a golden cross, we should be open to seeing Bitcoin move higher. And the move could get very, very explosive very, very quickly. I often say this, that people show up to these crypto markets and Bitcoin because they want outsized gains and volatility. And yet, within a few months or weeks of consolidation of a choppy period, people tend to throw their toys out of the pram, have a temper tantrum, get all frustrated that they haven't bought five Lambos and a harem of women just yet. And they entirely forget that Bitcoin can and does do Bitcoin things. It can, when it gets going, move very, very quickly. And something that we've got right here that is on our side for seeing a very quick and explosive move is there is $6 billion worth of Bitcoin shorts that will be liquidated at 65K. And as if that's not enough, there is $21 billion of shorts ready to be liquidated above 70K. So if we can indeed get a little bit of bullish price action, perhaps catalyzed by some of the macro data events that are coming up over the coming week or two, this thing could start to very, very quickly morph into one of these prior explosive upside moves, right when, as I said, everyone has kind of given up on it. Everyone has kind of forgotten that Bitcoin can and often does explode very, very violently and very, very vertically. Like I said earlier, a lot of people come into this market because that's what they're looking for. And then when something like this happens, they just go, oh, well, that's it. It's never going to pump. It's incapable. It's impossible. I see people write that all the time. It's impossible for Bitcoin to go to 100K. Well, it's not. OK, it's just 100 percent move from where we are. Again, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying don't sleep on Bitcoin. Bitcoin can and often does do this. Not to mention there might be a little bit of risk appetite return into the market because we're seeing improving global breadth. Breadth speaks to the amount of participation in a market. When we have a handful of stocks doing well and everything else doing rubbish, okay, we say that the breadth is narrow. And when everyone is buying everything hand over fist, small caps, medium caps, large caps, when we've got a large amount of participation in the stock market, we say that the breadth is widening. And right now, that's what we've got in improving global breadth. Now, if I zoom in here, once we get the breadth widened, we typically see upside for the stock market. OK, in most of these cases, we get big rip roaring rallies for some time to come. And of course, at the hard right edge, that's what we've got today. Based on historical data alone, it tells us that there's probably a lot more gas left in this goose. However, I do think this time it might be slightly different. And the reason I say that is this is the bull bear market indicator by Goldman Sachs. Notice where it is on the left hand side of the screen. It's up at 70 percent. OK, these are the sorts of levels that we don't see very often, but when we do see them, and here's the key part, when the bull bear market indicator rolls over, which it appears to be doing, that's the dark blue line. You see it's made a touch and now it appears to be rolling over. All the other times we saw this, particularly from that 70% level that we've just hit, okay, we entered global recessions. It was the GFC, here was the dot-com bubble. If this metric is gonna continue to roll over, Okay, it tells us to keep an open mind about seeing a bear market show up as well as a global recession. Look at this in blue, a world bear market. Meanwhile, as I said, we've got a lot of important macro data coming out. On Thursday, we have got initial jobless claims. Okay, so that is likely going to be a major market catalyst. And then next week on the 11th, which is Wednesday, we happen to have the CPI data coming out. And I sit here and still maintain 
that the majority of the market participants have gotten this wrong. They are looking at this right here, which is the 70s compared to the 2020s, where inflation in red back in the 70s had this big spike, a cool off, and then resumed to the upside quite violently. And I think people are continuing to make the same mistake with the blue, which is the current CPI cycle. They are suggesting that just because it is tracked so far that we are going to see something like this occur. And a lot of people are saying that the Fed, therefore, if it starts to cut rates, in September the 18th meeting, as it is expected to, may risk runaway inflation as we had again in the 70s. And I have still been making the case over and over again that the majority of the market participants, since they believe this, are on the wrong side of this trade. The risk here, in my humble opinion, is deflation. And I think we're about to see that once we get to the 11th and the CPI data is released. I think for the first time, we are going to see the beginning of the acceleration to the downside. I think people are going to finally start to work out that the Fed has been very, very late to start cutting and that inflation is no way near as sticky as they think because they have been interpreting the short term wobble in the data set as sticky inflation when in fact the real risk here is continuation of rapid disinflation before ultimately a short period of asset price deflation especially if the stock market is going to top sometime in the not too distant future. So CPI is going to be a very, very, very big data set for the camel crew, particularly for me, because on the 11th, we're going to find out if I have been completely wrong and everyone else has been correct in their assessment that inflation is quite sticky and therefore is going to continue to do something like this. Or conversely, we're going to find out if indeed everyone else is wrong and the real risk here is disinflation and deflation, which I think is going to show up. I really do think this is going to show up. And if it doesn't show up, then of course I am wrong. But Based on all of my analysis, this upcoming CPI print should be the print that reveals to the rest of the market they have indeed been positioned wrong. So it's going to be a very, very, very big print on the 11th. We'll go live for CPI as we always do. And in the meantime, it's just going to be a case of seeing how this week unfolds. The S&P 500 should be looking for new highs here. We'll see if we can get that. I'm also looking for the NASDAQ to start to really push up to the upside and set a third and final blow off top angle here, if indeed this is still in play. I'm also looking for the Dow Jones to continue confirming it has indeed already set its third and final angle, and I will be looking to exit the market and flip short on those breakdowns. I'm hoping there is still a one final flush lower to find that cycle low for the VIX, and then hopefully we can get some exposure on. And I'm going to continue to expect the breadth to widen as we continue to expect the Russell 2K to move move up towards my 2700 target. Gold still showing no sign of a clear cycle low just yet. So keeping a close eye on that and looking for silver once gold has found its cycle low to attack this $30 level and look for a breakout. Meanwhile, Bitcoin continues to just chop and range. But as I've showed you so far today, I think slowly but surely we're going to start to see the tide turn here and we're going to start to see a direction change towards the upside. I think those shorts are ready to be liquidated starting at around 65k are a sit and duck. And I really don't think it's going to be too long before we start to punish those people for shorting Bitcoin. We might have to work out a little bit of short term volatility in the meantime and a bit of chop since the Dixie is in the middle of putting in a counter trend bounce. But I would expect this daily cycle to left translate and then roll over one final time. We'll see if we can get that. And I think the same is true of the yields. We're getting this kind of counter trend bounce. To me, it looks like it wants to move lower, particularly if it knows rate cuts are coming in about two weeks time. Is it two weeks? two and a half, something like that. So again, in the short to medium term, we could get these little bits of wobbles in the dollar and in the yields, and that could put pressure on some of the risk assets, Bitcoin and gold at all. But overall, I do think the trend remains down. It seems silly to be trying to call bottoms here, especially with the rate cuts just around the corner. I kind of expect this week to be a bit boring, but I think things should start to heat up as of next week when we get the CPI. Other than that, I am still kind of taking it cautious. I'm not all in here. I'm still gradually building the exposure as the market proves itself to me. I'm still hyper aware that we could very quickly morph into some very, very bearish looks. And then when we look at all the recession data and the Goldman Sachs bear market indicator that I showed you earlier, that, you know, there's plenty of signs here that if we are to get a rollover, we'd be able to look back at them and say, well, that made a lot of sense. So I'm by no means putting my feet up on the desk, max long, blindly waiting for a rip roaring bull market. I'm as ever taking it one day at a time and being cautious. Overall, I don't really see a great deal to be too concerned about in the immediate term. Of course, if things change, I will let you know in tomorrow's video. And until then, take care from me. All the best. Cheers. Bye.